everyone. So this paper is with my co-authors, Onur Tosun and Arman Eshragi. So they're both working for Cardiff. And the title of the paper is very punchy. Um, I, I think I have to thank Onur and Arman for that. It's staring death in the face. So the paper is about the financial impact of corporate exposure to previous disasters. Now, when the Corona crisis started, uh, we could all see that there was a very sharp drop, about 30-35% in almost every stock exchange in the world. So this is a pandemic and it's unusual for the stock markets to react to a virus this sharply. But this is an extraordinary event. And it brought majority of the countries in the world near bankruptcy, majority of firms near bankruptcy. And the initial estimate from the IMF for uh, the world GDP is about a reduction in the range of 3%. That's huge and it's comparable and a little bit more of the uh, shrinkage in world GDP during the 2008 crisis and it's comparable to the Great Depression of the 1930s. So, there is a lot of threat to uh, human capital gains. Um, education is halted and many other sectors is halted. Uh, there, were, there is stress on um, distribution of foods and food products. And we're going through a major event across the world. So there is a big fear that's coming with that. And the initial reaction about the uncertainty of how this event, this pandemic will unfold has created enormous loss um, in uh, share prices. So the one thing that uh, we discussed initially is the nature of the firms, how they will respond, etc. So it's very clear that the shutdown sectors, hospitality, air travel, etc., uh, will have the biggest of this impact. But it's also important to look into these sectors and into every other sector, basically, to see if there are some firms who can cope with this crisis better than the others. There is a very thin epidemic literature uh, that uh, discusses the um, impact of uh, epidemics on uh, the businesses and how businesses cope with that. And there is another uh, strand of literature on various uh, disasters, including earthquakes, including volcanoes, including airplane crashes, including terrorist activity. And these are all exogenous events. So in this case, we're talking about an event which is purely exogenous to the corporate sector and which is purely exogenous to the financial sector. So when you look at the previous two big crises, the 2008 crisis, and the Great Depression of 1929, there is a part of it that developed within the financial sector. So this is not coming from the financial sector. It's not coming from the real sector either, like many of the um, um, uh, crises elsewhere in the world, but it's coming from a completely external factor, which is the pandemic in this case. And in that sense, it's similar to the terrorist attacks. And we thought the most recent one being September 11, we're talking about an event that's a shock to the system, it's external to the system, and it creates enormous fear in the system. So the basic discussion 
about the impact of September 11 and the impact of terrorist events in general is with respect to the shift in the public mood. So these events might be localized. Uh, for example, uh, the September 11, it happened in New York only, but it did have impact not only in America, but it did have impact worldwide. And we, we could see that it, it did increase the correlations across the world. So the global correlations increase and there was a global reaction in the financial markets and in the corporate sector across the world to this event. And similarly, we observe the same for the corona pandemic. Therefore, the first thing we wanted to see was uh, whether or not firms can gain some sort of immunity to previous exposure to fearful events. So if they have faced that before, and if they have survived it, does it make it, does it make these firms stronger? So what we have done basically is to test if firms gain some sort of immunity by dealing with deathly events, that's uh, bankruptcy in the case of firms, that threatens the firms to their bones. If they cope with it once, are they stronger to cope with it a second time? So what we're looking into is if firms with prior exposure to disastrous events experience favorable market condition reactions during the COVID pandemic. So what we're looking into, not the differences between the industries, but the differences between the firms in the same industry. So the industry can be airlines or the industry can be food manufacturing, but we're looking at the differences between those firms within these industries. So Onur will give you the details of the data set and the details of the methodology that we have used. But briefly, what we describe is we look at firms that were headquartered in New York at the time of September 11. So they took the hit there, they're located there. They took the hit to their uh, company premises. They took a hit to their employers. They took a hit to their operations. And it's a very tough situation to deal with for any corporation dealing with an event like September 11. So we're taking them as firms that have prior exposure to a disaster. And then we look and compare them to their industry peers to see if they have developed financial resilience and if they could cope with the COVID crisis better because they survived a previous one. So once we look at that, we see that these firms, of course, incur losses because it's another crisis, but their losses are about 7% lower compared to firms that were not exposed to September 11, which is economically a very high number. And when we look at these immune firms, we also see that the raw returns that they gain is somewhere between 14 to 15%. And even if we adjust for the riskiness of the current situation, it goes down to about 13%. And we also look at if these firms attracted more attention. So if the market participants knew that they survived once and estimated them to survive a second time. And if you can observe this from the trading activity and yeah, we will report that yes, yes, we observe that as well. So at this stage, I'm leaving the rest of the presentation to Onur to present you with the data 
the methodology and the main results of the paper. And then our mom will take over. We have quite a number of robustness tests. He will go over the robustness tests and he will conclude. Thank you very much. So, Onur, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Onur. All right. So, um, I'll carry on here uh, with the presentation. But before, uh, I would like to thank you uh, to have me here. It's a great pleasure uh, to be a part of this uh, webinar. And uh, um, let's uh, carry on with our um, sample. So uh, I would like to focus on the data first. So the period of our analysis runs from December the 9th, 2019 to April the 30th, uh, to 2020. And the time interval of the study includes two months of this treatment period, which is starting uh, March the 2nd, 2020. You can ask why we have picked that day, because we purely relied on uh, the data. If you look at this graph, it, you will see the distribution of the reported cases in uh, New York City, as well as the deaths uh, due to COVID-19. It's taken from the uh, government website. And the very first reported case goes back to March the 2nd, 2020. So that is the reason why we started our treatment period at that time. And if you look at uh, the figure, um, uh, soon after a week or so, there's a huge spike in terms of uh, the cases and it increased exponentially up until uh, the first week of April, after which it starts to decline. And uh, unfortunately, as expected, uh, the deaths have a similar distribution, but a lagged ones. So uh, like, Gilner have a little, like Gilner has also mentioned, uh, I would like to go over quite a, a briefly about how we described our immune firms versus our peer or control firms. The immune firms are the ones uh, which uh, have their headquarters in New York City and uh, their shares operated in the three major stock markets in New York City as well, the New York Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange American, which we know MX previously, and NASDAQ. And we look at particularly the period between September the 10th, 2001 and 30th of November, 2001, a three month period to identify those firms uh, who have experienced um, the horrifying effect of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. So those are the firms actually which uh, uh, faced uh, with uh, almost you know, the collapse and all this you know, huge impact of this horrible um, attack and survived. Um, and those firms, we also conditioned that they should be operating during COVID-19 uh, period as well, like we said, starting March 2020. And uh, so when we did that, we end up having 114 um, immune firms. We keep saying immune firms because like Gunnar mentioned, um, since these firms uh, faced this horrible event um, back in 2001, and they survived and they still uh, kept that operations and up until the COVID-19 uh, period. So these firms already fa uh, uh, faced the fear of death, uh, so to say, uh, during 9-11 attacks. For our control sample or the peer group, we look at uh, again the firms um, operating, uh, the, having, the, having their headquarters in New York City and uh, their shares uh, being traded in these three major markets, stock markets. Um, obviously operating during COVID-19 time, but not during 9-11 period. This is a crucial point because uh, these are the peers, these are the controls, which should not have experienced such a de uh, devastating uh, deathly event. So we have ended up uh, 331 control firms, overall 445 firms we have, and approximately 43,000 firm day observations. So let's have a look at this figure here, which shows the distribution uh, of the industries, both for immune firms as well as the control firms. We should keep this in mind. It is quite important that we need to have a, as similar as possible these two groups. It's primarily important here, the industries, because um, as we know, various industries were affected particularly by the government regulations and they're shut down during the COVID-19 period. Therefore, industrial classification is quite important in our case. 
we use uh, four digit SIC codes. And as you can see, the majority, about 60% in both group belong to the finance sector, followed by about 10% with the services, again, another 10% with healthcare and consumer goods and other industries. Other industries include um, uh, retail, wholesale, transportation, uh, communication, and uh, utilities. So we obtain our daily data on uh, firm stock prices, trade volume, and dollar volume uh, for publicly traded US firms from uh, CRISP. Excess returns are defined as the daily returns in excess of the risk free rate, which is approximated by one month treasury bill rate. We measure market activity by three different measures. One of them is the traded volume. It is the daily average traded volume in amount of shares. The other one is dollar volume in US dollars. The third one, we call it signed uh, uh, volume, signed traded volume. It is a signed version of the traded volume, which is calculated by pro uh, the product of realized daily returns and daily average traded volume. It's an important measure, why? Because it gives us the pressure on the market. The first two measure basically tells us how many shares are traded. So it gives us the trading activity, but doesn't tell us the direction of the uh, activity. The third one, if it's a positive coefficient in the results, mean that it would mean that there will be a buy pressure on the market by the investors demanding the shares of those immune firms. If it's a negative coefficient, it would mean that there's a sell pressure in the market. Uh, regarding the shares of the immune firms. We also have few uh, robustness tests, in one of uh, which we followed a McTier et al. 2013 paper and construct a daily change in nat natural logarithm, both for the traded volume as well as the dollar volume as dependent variables. And um, we also controlled uh, for the risk factors uh, such as market risk, size, value, investment opportunities, and profitability following from French uh, 2015. We control for aggregate market behavior uh, in returns regression by the total market value expressed in billions of US dollars. In further robustness tests, we follow Hassan et al. papers 2019 and 20 and incorporated various firm level risks. These risk measures rely on word counts that condition proximity to the use of synonyms for risk or uncertainty. Particularly, there is also a measure called the COVID-19 risk and this is the frequency basic dimensions of synonyms for risk or uncertainty or related to COVID-19 divided by the length of the transcript. We simply borrowed these, uh, definition of, these definition of the risks and included in our paper for robustness purposes. Right, let's have a quick look at the summary statistics here, both for the immune groups and the control groups. Focusing on the mean values, you can see clearly that the immune firms are larger compared to the, uh, the control firms. Uh, in terms of returns, both have similar level of uh, returns. Uh, the traded volume and the dollar volume uh, are higher for the immune firms due to their size. The signed volume, on the other hand, looks like on the similar level. So let me talk about the methodology here first and give you some initial results. We first would like to examine the market, or whether the markets react differently to the immune firms than the control firms during the COVID-19 period. Therefore, therefore, we first focus on the uh, car calculations. The abnormal returns are measured using three different estimation windows, three, six, and nine months, which end 60 days before the COVID-19 period, which is March the 2nd, 2020. We estimate abnormal returns using the two different event windows, one month, basically the, the entire March, and the two month period, March and April uh, 2020. The expected returns are estimated using the recent five factor specifications of Farmer Pension 2015. We also um, replicated our results using three factors model and Carhartt four factor model. The results are virtually the same. And lastly, we construct the uh, cumulative abnormal returns for those firms for COVID-19 period. We repeat this exercise for the control firms as well, so that we can have a comparison at the end. So here are the results. Let's focus on the first bunch, which is the first month, uh, well, one month period. And for simplicity, let's look at the three months um, results first. As you can see there, 
uh, the immune firm, the results for immune firms are statistically not significant, which means the markets do not react significantly uh, to the immune firms. However, if you look at the control firms for the three months estimation window, you can see it is negative and statistically very significant at 8.5%, which means the firms uh, or a regular firm, the peer firm, which has not experienced uh, this uh, death, such a similar deathly event before, have a negative cumulative abnormal return. And the important thing is the difference is about 7% and statistically very significant, which means at the very first impact of this COVID-19, at the very first month, the control firms and normal regular firm get impacted negatively in the market. However, if the firm has already experienced or so-called immunized, then there is no negative reaction to that firm. The results are also statistically significant and similar for six and nine months uh, estimation windows as well. Now let's you know, shift the gears and look at the, the two months, the entire period as a, as a whole here. There you can see uh, the control firms um, have turned their operations around and started to have some uh, level of um, positive um, cumulative abnormal returns. Again, the important thing is that uh, focusing on the immune firms here, in terms of magnitude, as well as the difference here, they are statistically very significant and stronger uh, for the immune firms. Meaning that um, at the very first month when there's a first shock hit, there is no significant, uh, there is no significant uh, effect in the market, which means they are immune towards the negative, potential negative shock in the market compared to control firms. And when you focus the entire period, the immune firms do better compared to their peers due to their immunizations. And uh, like I said before, the results are um, similar and uh, robust for the six and nine months uh, estimation windows. So these were the initial results. But we would like to take the next step and talk about some sort of causal effect of immunization on firms during COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, we introduce a difference and difference analysis uh, in the following form. We have the dependent variable as market reaction, which represents the return, excess return, traded volume, dollar volume, and the signed volume. We have the interaction of the immune and post. Immune is a dummy variable for immunized firms, as we described before. Post is a dummy variable, which is equal to one for each day in the two month period, starting March the 2nd, 2020, and zero for the three months uh, period before, which we describe as a control uh, period. We also have control variables, um, uh, day fixed effects and firm fixed effects. We do not have immune and post variables separately in the model because they are subsumed by those uh, fixed effects, as I mentioned. And um, here are the main results in terms of our uh, returns. As you can see, the interaction immune post has statistically significant and positive results for the return and excess return. What does it mean? It means if the firm is immunized, which means if the firm faced the fear of death before, and uh, in this case, during the COVID-19 period, the, that firm is doing better in terms of the return compared to their controls, to their peers. And this is quite robust if you also look at the excess returns as well. What about the market activity? As you can see, in, in terms of the traded volume and dollar volume, they are statistically very significant and positive, which means again, the shares of the immune firms are traded more uh, during the uh, COVID-19 period. But as of, as of now, we do not know which direction it's, it's traded. It might be sold or bought. So that will be told us by the last column, by the signed volume. If you look at the, uh, the coefficient, it's statistically very significant and positive, which means that there is a buy pressure in the market, and meaning that the investors are indeed demanding the shares of those uh, immune firms uh, during the COVID-19 period. So uh, these are the main results of our uh, uh, paper. And uh, my colleague uh, Arman Shragi will take it from there and he will talk about, about the robustness test and conclude the, uh, the presentation. Let me stop sharing uh, screen now.
Arman, you are on mute, I suppose. Uh, my apologies. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, excellent. Uh, right. Okay, so um, uh, I similarly uh, welcome all of you to this afternoon to our webinar and uh, look forward to your questions and comments. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is to continue with uh, explaining what we have done to further look at the robustness and sensitivity of our results. So the first thing we've done is um, obviously the question arises, we are looking at cross-sectional variation. So the question is, um, are we sufficiently controlling for mm -hmm. what we know about the sensitivity of various firms to, to, to the risks around pandemics and generally to, to all risks and concerns that are out there. Now, um, there are a series of papers by Hassan et al. Uh, which have done very interesting textual analysis on quarterly corporate filings. And uh, 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 what they show is basically that this series of uh, textual measures can be quite uh, robust in uh, telling companies apart in terms of their cross-sectional variations. And they've recently provided their COVID scores freely as well. Um, so we have taken that. Uh, first, we have looked at the overall risk. Thankfully, um, our results remain robust. So once we controlled for the overall risk measure from Hassan et al paper, um, the uh, the um, the results remain robust as you can see um, across all five dimensions: return, excess return, uh, and and volume in in all these three definitions. Um, but um, more importantly, when we control for COVID-related risk, uh, then again you can see that the results uh, remain uh, significant and uh, uh, and. Uh, perhaps marginally in terms of the magnitude of the coefficients, marginally lower. So as you can see from about 14% on the return coefficient to 12%, but still, uh, still uh, that's a sizable coefficient. <laughs> and the same goes for the others. So, okay, so we passed that test. Um, then um, then uh, what we do is that uh, we try to uh, look at uh, look at uh, different time periods, and uh, so as you remember, the definition of our uh, post uh, dummy variable was based on two months after the event, which was the second of March. So then we question, uh, then we ask, what would happen if you focus on the first month, which is the initial month, so the big hit, and. Uh, um, so if you define your post ver dummy variable as one month after the events, then in fact, our coefficients grow in size. And uh, again, they remain statistically significant. So that's interesting. So what this is showing is that the differential behavior or the stock price reaction between immune firms and non-immune firms is actually larger during the first month. And then it goes down. Um, <clears throat> so as the as the shock hits, you can see quite a significant reaction. So initially it was about fourteen percent. In this case, it's about thirty three percent. Or when you look at excess returns, thirty four percent. And all, all the other controls are there. So everything else is there. Um, right. Uh, the next uh, the next uh, robustness test uh, looks at um, the basically different measures of market activity. So what, uh, what we do here is we follow that classic McTeer et al. paper, which was published in JFQ um, titled, Do Stock Markets Catch the Flu? And what they do in that paper is not only they look at uh, uh, trading volume, uh, but they also look at delta trading volume. Uh, so that's the daily change in, in volume from one day to the next. And this is particularly uh, useful in very volatile situations, such as when 
COVID had initially hit. Um, so we, we do the same thing uh, and uh, we run our regressions with Delta volume, both for traded volume and dollar volume. And our results, again, remain um, significant, though probably slightly less significant in terms of level of significance, but still, still there and they're the right sign. Um, so we are, uh, we are past that hurdle, I guess. Um, then, um, then what we do is uh, we look at uh, uh, the sectors and um, um, about 60% of our sample is finance companies, uh, which is not surprising because we look at all the companies in New York, home of Wall Street. So then we thought, okay, uh, what would happen if we exclude all the finance companies and look at all the rest? And uh, um, what we notice is, is in fact, the, res uh, the magnitude of the results increase. So again, from about 14% for the overall sample, we go up to 36% uh, for, for non-finance companies. Um, and that is interesting. Um, um, and we think the reason for that is uh, finance companies um, are perhaps more resilient compared to the other sectors because they, they were quicker to move their workforce to work from home. Um, they, their service is kind of digital. Whereas, for example, when you look at sectors such as catering, you know, the restaurants, travel, tourism, they were very badly hit. So there's a lot of other sectors which are very badly hit. And um, therefore the return differential uh, for, for all those non-finance sectors is significantly higher for when you compare those, those companies that were around in 9-11 had, had already been through it once compared to the others that were not. So that is, uh, that is I think, interesting. Um, we also, uh, look at uh, those industries which uh, went through a shutdown. So specifically those industries that were, uh, that were affected directly by the lockdown. So that includes, you know, uh, obviously the restaurants, all the catering, entertainment, cinemas, um, uh, air travel, and so on and so forth. Um, so we, we were wondering what would happen if we looked at those industries specifically? Um, and as you can see, um, again, our results are continue to be significant and uh, they are considerable in terms of the size of the coefficients. Um, so once again, I think the interpretation for this is that those industries that were directly affected by the shutdown uh, benefit from a higher return differential when you compare those that lived through 9-11 with those that did not have the chance to live through 9-11. So it's a bit like um, you, you earthquake proof your home and the benefits of earthquake proofing your home are, are higher if you're closer to the epicenter of an earthquake that might hit in the future. Uh, and I think that's, that's what we're seeing here. Um, Similarly, for those industries that were not shut down, we do see a return differential, but to a lesser extent, um, which I think is consistent with, with, uh, with the story that uh, we just went through. Right, so uh, to summarize, um, we have noticed that uh, the companies that we call the immune companies, so they've lived through 9-11 once, uh, those companies tend to have 7% uh, lower losses uh, when you do a cumulative abnormal return type of analysis. And when you do a diff in diff analysis, they tend to have 14% higher raw returns and 15% higher excess returns, which are significant numbers. Um, um, and not only that, but also their trading volume um, is, considerably higher. And we also showed that this is because there's more pressure on the buying side by looking at the signed volume of the trading. Now, uh, these results are consistent across different sectors in the industry. 
we've controlled for uh, as many firm fixed effects as we could throw at the regressions, including COVID-specific risk factors from uh, Hassan et al. papers. Um, right, so to conclude, uh, um, we think or we hope that this project uh, will make um, a threefold contribution to the finance literature. Firstly, when it comes to the literature on market reaction to the spread of diseases and epidemics, uh, we believe we have unearthed cross-sectional variations that have not been documented in the pandemics literature before. Um, similarly, when it comes to uh, the uh, literature on market reactions to terrorist events, we have specifically shown that the case for 9-11 is worth looking into again, because at least in the case of 9-11, uh, we see that uh, that has made uh, New York-based companies that have survived over the next, over the following two decades, more resilient in terms of, in terms of the reaction to a similar event. Now, I think it's worth highlighting this, that of course, 9-11 and COVID are categorically different events. And this is a point also made by Golnur and Orlor as well. But uh, they are, the similarities are not to be underestimated because they were both um, completely unexpected and they both hit uh, New York very badly. Uh, and uh, and uh, they both had significant con consequences afterwards. So in that respect, we couldn't find any other disaster that, that would parallel COVID, any other natural disaster or any other man-made disaster that would parallel COVID in that respect. And specifically, once you have a clean experiment of looking at New York. Um, thirdly, um, we noticed that this resilience has been uh, priced in for in the market for quite a while because some things happened in 9-11. Either, either the firms have learned, so there is a story of organizational learning, um, or investors bear in mind that this company has been through it once. This company has lived through something quite drastic once and they price it in. And I personally think both of these are happening at the same time. So there is both an endogenous um, um, story of organizational learning. And also there is, uh, there is the fact that investors are pricing in. And therefore we think that this paper also makes a contribution to the literature on long-term market reactions and market memory. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you found this paper and this joint work uh, of interest and we very much look forward to having a conversation with you. Thank you. Lovely, thank you um, for the presentation. So we have some questions and some hands raised. Um, so we have um, Saad um, Aftab, who I will permit to talk now, Saad, if you'd like to unmute your mic and go ahead, please. Uh, hello. So it's a very interesting paper. So I have a few concerns. Firstly, as you mentioned, that uh, uh, the 9-11 event wasn't really similar to the COVID event because during the 9-11 event, I'm not sure, but I think that there wasn't a shutdown of firms. So that is the first concern. Secondly, I, have, uh, I was thinking about your control group. And I think uh, the uh, the immunized firms uh, they were they were the firms that weren't present during the 9/11. So I think a critical factor is firm age. So maybe those firms are younger. That's why they didn't uh, uh, they were affected uh, badly compared to the other firms. So uh, that is my question basically. Yes. Uh, so. Um... I can quickly take it and then um, Onur and Golner. Um, we, we do, con uh, thank you Saad very much, by the way, for your question. And that's a very good question. We do control for firm age. Um, and uh, we, we specifically showed that there's something about 9-11. So for example, if you did a placebo test, which I think we've done, and if you looked at just this, you know, firms that existed, say, 
before 2004 and after 2004, just randomly, you don't, you don't pick up anything. But there's something specific about the nature of 9-11, which has lent to this organizational learning. Uh, but owner can tell you more about, and also yeah. again, Golner can tell you more about specifically. I think I'm going to leave it with Onur because he has finished some more uh, robustness tests. Indeed. Uh, and the results are robust for age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Onur. Um, so, uh, Saad, again, thank you very much. These are quite uh, uh, spot on qu uh, comments. The first of all about the firm age. So, um, uh, we in, in the presentation slides I mentioned, so uh, when we define the immune firms, we uh, requested them uh, particularly uh, to, to uh, operate at the three month period starting September the 10th until uh, three months after that, which means uh, um, all the other firms that you know operate, let's say year 2002, 2003, they are already in our uh, sample in terms of the control firms. So the age difference actually are not that high between the control firms and the, um, and the firms, uh, the so-called immune firms. So if there is an age difference, it should be only one or two years. Of course, I understand your point. We do also have younger firms as well in our uh, control sample, but our control sample also includes so-called older firms as well, which are matched uh, with the, uh, the immune firms. And uh, also, um, uh, we do not have uh, the tabulated results in the presentation, but I recently finished um, a PSM approach, propensity score matching, in which uh, I match in terms of the size, uh, the industry, uh, Tobin skew and profitability. Results are still robust in that case as well. Uh, and in terms of uh, the 9-11 comment, uh, mm -hmm. yes, you are right that um, the sectors are not necessarily well, physically shut down, but that was this uh, immense fear of, oh, okay, so is there going to be another terrorist attack a week after, a year after, you know, a couple of months after? Still that kind of unspoken, uh, the psychological um, uh, impact on the firms, on the employees and the operations are there. So that was also uh, the aspect that we take in terms of comparison with COVID-19 as well, this huge uncertainty, this huge fear. And also, I think the sector specific impact in that respect is not dissimilar because when, uh, when, when the towers were hit, tourism uh, was brought to a standstill in New York for several months. Uh, um, but the services, for example, the financial sector uh, and, and those, everything that could, could be done from home were, was continued, uh, was, was able to continue. So I think in those respects, in fact, this, there are similarities. Air travel was badly affected, again, as you see with COVID and you saw with 9-11. So on the surface, I think uh, they might look different, but they were, they were quite interesting similarities between the two. Okay, thank you so much. That answers it, thank you. Thank you. So now we've got um, in the Q&A um, a question from Faslin. Um, so hello, panellists. Thank you for the interesting research. Could the immune firms also be of well-established firms as compared to the other group? Hence, their usual non-crisis experience also plays a big part in their management towards COVID-19. Um, if I may, so uh, I would like to say a few things about that. First of all, that's again a very good uh, point. So um, uh, we did some follow-up tests where we um, uh, conducted a placebo test, which means um, we kept the same model, but the shifted the timeline six months, nine months, a year before. So in order to see whether those um, immune firms are also doing better in, in normal times as well compared to control firms. If the answer is yes, then your point might be the correct one, meaning that those firms are already quite resilient firms, already quite well-managed firms. Interestingly, uh, we do not find any significant results. All our significance has disappeared. So that tells us those uh, immune firms are not too different actually compared to their peers when the times are normal, when the, you know, the times are all good, great, but their uh, benefits only show up when there's a huge uh, impact in terms of negative impact in terms of their operations. Let me also add that even in the main estimations, we control for almost every firm characteristic. 
So uh, the, the size we control for, profitability we control for, etc. So almost for every firm character, even in the main, I mean, uh, no, don't, don't, don't come to the robustness test, but even in the main equation, we control for almost every, uh, you know, thinkable uh, firm characteristic, yeah. Mm. Um, at this stage, I mean, I, I want to add something to Arman in his previous answer. Um, and I think this crisis in its sectoral impact is pretty close to 9-11. Mm. So, I mean, in, in numbers, in broad general average numbers, we see that as well. But anecdotal evidence, I traveled to US after September, about a month after September 11, and on the plane, other than me, there were four more people. So we're talking about this 300, 600 people, huge train, uh, huge planes. So very clearly, air travel helped, and it's one of the industries that hit hard during this crisis as well. The same thing for the hospitality sector, staying in a hotel, traveling a foreign country, traveling another city, eating out in a restaurant, they all had it after September 11. And in, in terms of the main fear, the two events are extremely similar. The main fear is the fear of death. So in the case of COVID, the main fear is the fear of death for a different reason. This time it's uh, a virus. In the case of September 11, it's again the fear of death for a different reason, it could be a terrorist group attacking. But in both cases, the danger is invisible and the fear is the fear of death. So I think therefore the impact was basically on consumer oriented sectors in both cases. Exactly. Thank you. So now, if I'm going to unmute Richard and um, Tafla. Richard, if you could unmute your mic and ask your question. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, what uh, an interesting paper, uh, beautifully presented, uh, innovative, uh, um, and, and really uh, challenging. Congratulations. Uh, very persuasive. Thank you. A number of my comments have already been addressed, um, but a, a, a couple of things, I think. Um, uh, Gulno, the point you just made about similar emotional impact I think is very important, and that could be hopefully uh, in your introduction, just arguing the similar um, fear of death or the, the emotional resonance of the two, uh, which helps to enrich the, uh, uh, the, the, the awareness of what might be going on. Um, but I'm, so, uh, I, I'm just wondering if there's some way of actually looking at how uh, the media uh, reported, um, just to show some, some comparisons, again, to give a bit more context, mm -hmm. uh, how the media was sort of talking about you know, firms, perhaps in different sectors, um, 2011, and, and uh, in similar ways um, uh, during COVID. <coughs> and the second uh, point, uh, additional point, those that have already been addressed, is um, I'm just wondering, uh, did your, did your uh, placebo test uh, actually um, deal with the question of whether those firms which uh, were alive in 2011 and which uh, two thousand, yeah, uh, two thousand, and which survived to the end of the period. Were they different in some way to those which were alive then, but weren't uh, still listed in mm -hmm. two thousand twenty? Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if there's another comparison that can be made, and another uh, a, a robustness test, just to 
deal with some special nature of the firm that survived or in fact it may well be that uh, those firms which were more robust in 2011 are generally more robust uh, anyway just some thoughts yeah thank you very much richard i think i'm going to go with the first round of answers yes you're really right we can conduct another placebo uh, to compare the survivors to the non-survivors to see whether they were strong even uh, during the first crisis. We haven't done that, but we can do that. I think that's a very good suggestion. We can certainly do that. And I think the second point you raise about the media reporting, I, th I think it might even be um, an independent analysis. Because, I mean, we haven't studied it, but there are similarities in the way uh, that the event unfolded in terms of reporting the number of deaths, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, and reporting the uncertainty, the unknownness, who did it, how did it happen? You know, is it coming from here? Is it coming from there? Is it coming from Wuhan? how many people traveled, how many people came in that plane, in this plane. So I, I think it might be, I think it's a very good idea and I think it might be an independent analysis of its own. I, I, think, I think it's a wonderful idea, yeah. And thank you very much uh, for the suggestion to include the uh, analysis of the fear, the similarity of the fear more in the introduction um, I, I think we can certainly do that. Thank you very much. No, no. Th thank you. Thank you thank for you. your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Lovely. So we have um, a raised hand from Devon. Devon, um, I'll allow you to talk. And we have, we have something on the chat as well, Alicia. We do indeed. Um, but Devon, do you want yes. to... Yes. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, so I had a quick question about uh, the policy response at both times for both these events. Uh, there was um, uh, there was government policy response in the case of COVID, and of course it wasn't. Uh, I believe uh, uh, it, it wasn't at that time in nine eleven. So uh, in terms of fiscal response, I believe there is a variable in IM, IMFSS specific, which is country specific when it comes to government policy response uh, with the COVID and it's not there for 9-11. So I'm wondering if those controls, by including those controls might help to determine whether the policy response from the government or country perspective may result into uh, higher immune firms at the time of COVID. Mm. Um, I, I think I can take the first round on this question as well. I think that's a very good suggestion. Uh, the answer is no, we didn't look at the government policy response. So, I mean, again, I think it could be, can look at it as independently, because in this case, uh, the comparison we make is, you know, very solid. We have to be very careful in choosing who was exposed to the worst of it. And we need something comparable to that. But I think uh, the uh, policy response, I mean, it's similar in many ways in many countries, but also there are differences in policy response across Europe or across the world. And I mm -hmm. think, I mean, that deserves a full analysis. Mm -hmm. How helpful was the policy response uh, in alleviating the risk of bankruptcy uh, in uh, alleviating the losses in mm -hmm. the shutdown sectors, mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, I think that's a very good question. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, uh, there is a database uh, maintained by Oxford as well, uh, which yeah. has a data on government response tracker. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if there is a way to because it, it could be a country specific. Uh, response tracker that um, the university yeah. maintains, but I'm not sure whether that, if you could find a way to see if any of these uh, firms uh, within the sector that you're analyzing, they are benefited from yeah. this uh, response or not, so. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, That's I just, just want point. to add, thank you, Devin. Devin, thank you for, for that comment. Uh, and uh, I, just, I, I just want to agree with you that I think it deserves careful attention. 
Because, for example, if an airline was around during 9-11, and as, as we know, the airspace was shut down for several days, and then subsequent demand for air travel was hit. So if the government somehow um, supported the air, air travel industry post 9-11, immediately post 9-11, compared to an airline, let's say, which was founded several years later, uh, mm -hmm. surely the two must have had different uh, learning curves compared to dealing with a, in, in relation to dealing with an event like this. And I think mm -hmm. that's true. So probably we should look at sector specific responses uh, by, by the government. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So we have another question um, from Praveen um, who says, hi, thanks to all presenters for a lovely and insightful presentation. My question is, based on your research, the story with respect to firms which survived looks convincing. Do you have any data stories on firms that did not survive due to the shock? <laughs> I'll make the first round on this as well. I think that's a brilliant question. No, we don't. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of like wishful thinking maybe, but I hope we don't. Um, after this corona crisis. Uh, but the first, the, uh, um, the first for the corona crisis, the first round of full balance sheets will be available about March next year. Uh, for the non-survivors of September 11, we already have the data. Uh, and no, we didn't study their characteristics. And I think uh, it was, um, Richard's question as well. So did you look at the non-survivors? Were they already different from the survivors at that time? We haven't. And I think it's a good question in itself. Like, who are the survivors? I mean, how did they survive? Is it, is it some characteristic that they have? Is it like, you know, they're resilient in terms of their financial structures? Are they more innovative? We don't know. But I think that's a very good question uh, to ask. Thank you very much. Right, I think Richard has raised his hand again. So Richard, if you'd like to unmute, please. And, and don't forget William, he's on the um, chat. On the chat. chat. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay, if, I'll, I'll be, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, you started with a, a biological analogy. Um, uh, to my mind, that's actually quite crass and is not necessary. It, uh, firms are very different to uh, you know, viruses or uh, you know, <laughs> ants in colonies or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think the story is quite rich enough without, um, oh, this sort of biological finance, which seems really stretching incredulity. Um, so it's just, just a small point, so perhaps a matter of taste. But anyway, uh, just wanted to raise it. That's all right. Thank you, Richard. Th thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good point. Yeah. And um, so, yes, so apologies, William, and for not reading your comment out earlier. So William has said the following, love the paper. I guess it's a win for evolutionary rationality, like the article that asks, which would you rather have? A granddad who was rational or one that survived? Here, survival turns out to be useful, to be useful traits to have demonstrated. And that's from William Forbes. Okay, thank you very much for the comment, William. Uh, I mean, personally, I prefer uh, the granddad to be alive. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so if there are no more questions, I believe this concludes the event. So, um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Just as, oh, William just said, um, that's the right answer <laughs> in response. <laughs> so um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and I'd like everybody to refer to the chat function of this talk, um, which concerns our next event, which will be on Friday, the 4th of December, called the impact of COVID-19 on G7 stock markets volatility, evidence from an ST, 
hyphen HAR model. So I've added the link into the chat, please. Um, for more information, refer to the link and register and I'll get Gulnor now. I'll introduce Rafa Gulnor to close this event. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much everyone uh, for coming to this presentation. Uh, and if you want to talk a little bit further, either with myself, Honor, or Armand, feel free to send an email to us. Thank you very much.